time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine, and Mr. Carl Hess, press editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Theodore R. McKeldon, Governor of Maryland. Well, Governor, as you made the nominating speech for General Eisenhower at the Republican Convention, I don't suppose I have to ask you what you thought of the election. But I would like to ask whether you found any surprises in it. Yes, uh, I was surprised that uh, the majority was so completely overwhelming. I honestly believed that we were going to win. But I didn't think we were going to win with such majorities as that. For example, I predicted that Maryland would go for Eisenhower by 50,000. We broke an all-time record. We gave him 102,000 majority. I see by a calculation I made tonight that Maryland gave Ike uh, 55 and 7 tenths percent of its vote and the country in general gave him only 55 and 4 tenths percent of his vote. So it was rather surprising to find that Maryland was a little more Republican than the average of the country. Our was Democrats are very discriminating and intelligent in Maryland. Well, is this though a Republican victory in Maryland? Will it continue? That is, when you're up in, I believe it's 54, will this sweep continue? Do you With think? Of course, it was a vote against the policies of the uh, administration in Washington, I think, uh, more than it was a, a pro-vote. And yet, of course, there was a tremendous amount of support, uh, reflective and emotional, for General Eisenhower. Well, do you think that this is going to make the South hereafter? It's the beginning of a two-party system in the South? I believe this is the beginning of a two-party system in the South when you had the great leaders coming out in the South uh, and speaking boldly for Eisenhower. And when you had the followers in those states, South Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Florida, giving us such a, a vote as we have never had before in the entire South. I believe a two-party system is on its way, and it's good for the South. Well, they elected a fairly substantial congressional representation, didn't they? In my state? Well, in Maryland and a couple of other southern yes, states. Yes, in, uh, in quite a few of the southern states, we elected some Republican congressmen. We have seven congressmen from Maryland, and we elected four out of those seven. Aren't there some... Uh, in addition to a United States senator we elected also, we've got two Republican United States senators from Maryland now. Aren't there some southern senators, as a matter of fact, who might take a very important part? under Eisenhower. Yes, for example, with reference to uh, economy, and I think that is certainly the thing that the general is going to attack at the very beginning. We have got to balance the budget. And uh, I believe the general would be uh, uh, well advised to get in touch with Harry Flood Bird, the distinguished senator of the great state of Virginia, because he probably knows more about that budget uh, than any other person down there in Washington. Oh, well, speaking about the budget, where do you see the trimming? Well, I believe that there is waste in the civilian branches that almost amounts to corruption. People who are on the payroll, who do nothing for it. Harry Byrd, you remember, said in his opinion you could cut off 500,000 of them and save a couple billion dollars without affecting the efficiency of the operation of the government. Now, of course, these faithful civil service employees, nobody's going to touch those. But those who are getting money and doing nothing, we ought to get rid of them and get rid of them promptly, and I'm sure that Eisenhower is going to do that. Well, how about the military spending, Governor? Uh, I think that uh, go uh, President Truman is spending this year 50 times as much as Franklin Roosevelt spent in 1939 on defense. Now, do you think we can keep up that rate even of defense spending? No, I believe that if there's one man in this country who knows where we can cut the expenditures for defense and not adversely affect our own security, that man is certainly Eisenhower. And I feel confident that when he gets going, because he is a man of action, he's no procrastinator, he couldn't be to win the, the war in Europe, I believe he is going to show tremendous uh, economies even in the military departments. Well, will this extend into the, what is perhaps the most expensive part of the defense program, our foreign aid? Well, I believe that it is not possible for us to immediately eliminate our foreign aid. 
but I believe that uh, that we ought not to give the aid to any country unless that country is willing to make some sacrifice itself. And in other words, they ought to impose taxes. They ought not to uh, certain countries in Europe where their taxes are very light. Uh, if we're going to give them tanks, we ought to see their men, for example, in the tanks. If we're going to give airplanes, we ought to see their pilots flying them. And uh, they ought to make a contribution before we continue our help to them. Well, we're spending at the present time at a rate of about $10 billion a year for European military aid, or for all military aid. Now, do you think we'll be keeping up a rate anything like that? I don't know, but I think we ought to, of course, continue our military aid to Europe. We ought not to withdraw that aid, but I believe it is still possible to uh, eliminate uh, a considerable sum of that. Well, you feel that reflects the general's views, too? I think so. Mm -hmm. What do you think uh, were the uh, effective speeches in the election, one way or the other? While the election was going on, we heard a lot of talk. Newspapers would say, well, the McCarthy speech was effective, or the McCarthy speech was a flop. The Truman uh, Whistle Stop uh, campaign was effective, or the Truman Whistle Stop campaign was helping Eisenhower, uh, and so on. What do you think were the effective speeches? Well, and course, how did they affect the result? I think all speeches uh, are effective one way or the other. I mean, they're not wholly good and they're not wholly bad. Uh, but on political balance, you have to make up your own mind. For example, McCarthy's speeches, in, uh, in some sections of the country, they were very helpful. In other sections, they were not so helpful. Now, I think that Mr. Truman did a greater service for the Republican Party than almost any of the Republican speeches when he went on that whistle stop. I don't think Mr. Stevenson was very pleased with that. I believe that that lost Adelaide more votes than any other thing in the entire campaign. You, well, you've mentioned uh, McCarthy's speech, and you've had some experience because he campaigned in Maryland when you were swept into office. Uh, how, how do you think Eisenhower will now uh, support or uh, carry on this his fight against communists and government? Well, I believe that uh, McCarthy's role will not be as important now as it was under Harry Truman because I am confident that whatever communists are there, whatever files uh, are down in Washington will be made available to those who want to get the communists out. So it won't be necessary to make a lot of charges. They will be there. I think the files will be available and you can depend on the general to see that all the information is given to anybody who wants it, who's interested in getting rid of the communists. Well, then this, this would, might mean that the, what he started would be finished under Eisenhower. I think so. Yeah. A lot of people think the most effective speech in the campaign was Eisenhower's <coughs> statement that he would go to Korea. Now, what do you think uh, General Eisenhower is likely to do in Korea when he goes there, or after he comes back from there, let's say? Well, I, you remember the statement that his son John made, the major who was over there. He was looking at maps. He said, when you look at maps and you go out and see the territory, it's entirely different. I believe that the American people are anxious that the general, a great general, I believe that they are anxious that he should go to Korea. I think it would be a tremendous lift for the boys over there to find out the president-elect has not forgotten them. He's interested in them. And I believe that just the fact that he's going there will have a very sobering effect on those communists and on Russia. Would you I, think the whole right, ahead, well, I was sorry. wondering if you thought the whole election might have a sobering effect on, on Russia specifically. How will Stalin react to it? I think that Stalin is a very smart operator. As a matter of fact, I think their public relations uh, outsmarted us uh, from the very beginning. And I believe that Stalin, being a smart operator, he'll know that uh, this man uh, of ours, General Ike, uh, is a man of action. And he knows that when Ike says it's so far and no further, he will know that Ike isn't fooling. And when he talks like that, he'll be able to back it up. In other words, he's a Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, you expect that he will draw a line? I think he will draw a line. I think the American people want him to draw a line. We don't want this vacillation, one side today and another side tomorrow. We want him to say something and get going. I saw a story in this evening's news, one of this evening's papers that uh, Eisenhower would use the Shanghai Shek troops. Do you think he's likely to call on nationalist China, Chinese troops now? Well, there's a splendid army of them over there, and uh, I notice we're sending a lot of equipment, and they're all ready to fight for their own freedom. I don't believe we ought to uh, deny them that opportunity. Rather than send a lot of American boys over there, I think we got 250,000 American boys on the foreign line, and about 
ten percent of all other nations. I think we ought to give them an opportunity to do something for themselves. Well, I'd like, like to ask you as a final question, Governor, uh, what do you think the main effect would be of the, or will be, of the Eisenhower victory? Well, I believe that it has given new courage and new hope to our people. I believe it is the greatest shot in the arm that America has had in a long time. We're convinced that this man's foreign policy is right. He's going to do everything to get our boys out of Korea and end this thing. He's going to do everything he can to balance that budget. You can't balance your own budget unless the national uh, uh, budget is balanced. And uh, I think this man is going to get all of the crooks out of the government wherever they are. Well, you think in some that what he'll do is to restore confidence. Yes, we have lost faith and confidence in our government, and uh, this vote indicates it, and it will be restored under Eisenhower. Well, thank you very much, Governor, for being with us tonight. Thank you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Henry Hazlitt and Mr. Carl Hess. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Theodore R. McKeldin, Governor of Maryland. Every year, about this time, the great arena in New York's Madison Square Garden comes alive with color and drama as international society assembles for the National Horse Show. And this year again, Longines is official watch for all timing. As the thoroughbreds compete for championship ribbons, the judges consider two factors, their time performance and their beauty. For exactly the same reasons, discriminating people the world over make their choice of a fine watch. Longines, the world's most honored watch. In performance, Longines is truly unsurpassed. Year after year, Longines watches have won highest honors in competitive accuracy trials at great government observatories. And for excellence and elegance, only Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. The new Longines watches for Christmas giving now being featured by Longines Whitnaw jewelers, are conceived in exquisite good taste. You'll find a style and a type for every need and for every purpose. Yet this Christmas, you may give proudly a Longines watch for as little as 71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnaw Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight. May I remind you again about our Goodwill offer, this magnificent, long-playing anniversary record album, featuring music by the Longines Symphonet and the Whitnor Coraliers which our company has prepared for its friends. Its cost is only $1.95, and it's worth more than double. So see your Longine Whitmore jeweler for this anniversary record album, and see also the new and outstanding Longine Whitnor watches now on display for Christmas giving. From coast to coast, more than 4,000 Longine Whitmore jeweler agencies proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Challenging Entertainment, Omnibus, on the CBS Television Network.